Next Gen Fan, what is going we are on? Live. Happy Tuesday afternoon for those who are joining us live. I know folks are already coming in. Paul McNeil already Number one. beating us here. He's here. What's we going on? Jenna. How are you guys feeling, Next Gen? Next Gen team, thanks so much for tuning in. We had such an interest in getting this episode live. Boom. This is a sneak peek. Momentum Audio Season 2 not dropping for a little bit. We've got you covered today with a true present. We're pumped. But how are you feeling today, Jay? What's up? We know that we have some big guests that we've so needed for season two. We got Sam Zell joining us. Absolute incredible real estate billionaire. Daniel Lebeski from Kind, incredible philanthropist businessman. But this episode I am more excited for than so many because I can't we, – we'll tell you in a second, but this is going to be incredible. So we have to give a huge thank you to Natasha Srulowitz. Natasha, stand up She's for standing out there. Happen. Long Island, New York. Natasha, old gen, new gen, bringing her expertise to the next generation. We so appreciate you making this happen. Shout out Grandma Rose. I know you're tuning in Malachi, as well. Rachel, we've got you in the comments. We have a true, true treat today. So without further ado, we're going to get ready to dive in. Guy Kawasaki, yes, that guy, that's the one that you all know. He's the chief evangelist of Canva and the creator of his own podcast, Remarkable People. He's had insane guests from Wozniak to Tim Ferriss, and we're going to get all those links down for you to check out. He was, before even all this, at Apple, the chief evangelist there. He has written 15 books, including The Art of the Start 2.0, which we've all read. We've got it, nine copies on the stage. So without further ado, let's get Guy Kawasaki on Momentum Audio and welcome to the stage. <laughs> Guy, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. You guys you guys should switch to decaf. <laughs> <laughs> Guy, you, this is our secret sauce, all right? We can't be getting into too many secrets already, but our audience is stoked to have you here. Where we want to start is you have a great quote in saying, which is that entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur, it's more of a state of mind than a job yes. title. Guy, in your career, where did you start learning this? Because in school, you're not taught about entrepreneurship being this type of skill set and mindset. So take us back. Where did that first come, in, come about? I think it first came about when I saw I you know, companies like Hewlett Packard and and you know i saw that i was in hawaii at the time and if you're in hawaii your career path is sort of agriculture sugarcane pineapple or tourism or ala moana shopping center retail and i i figured out that there is another path called tech and i went to stanford as an undergrad which was just you know putting me in the middle of the liquor store <laughs> if you will. And uh, I never look back. Wow. Guy, that is so powerful for everybody who knows a bit about your story. You speak on from your grandparents to your parents, the opportunities that they made possible for you. And I want to yeah. flag one in particular that you talk about in your most recent book, uh, your sixth grade teacher, right? Who really yes. played a pivotal role in opening up doors for you. Looking back, something that Justin and I talk about all the time, we are a product of those we surround ourselves with. Who are some of those early leaders and how did they shape your entrance, as you said, into tech, going to Stanford and building sure. your life? Well, first, to give credit to that sixth grade teacher. So I was in the public school system of Hawaii and I came from a lower middle class, you know, not total poverty, don't have clothes, not eating, but not exactly rich either. You know, so uh, this teacher uh, in the public school, Kalihi Elementary, I guess saw potential in me and convinced my parents that they should take me out of the public school track and put me into a college prep track so that I would go to college and, you know, be all I can be. And so without her convincing my parents to do that and without my parents making that sacrifice, I don't know where I would be, but I would not be here. So, uh, you know, that was the, the lesson there is that you know, everybody talks about Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and how they dented the universe and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, if you're a teacher, if you're a coach, if you're a pastor, uh, you know, you may not make millions of computers, but you definitely can impact people's lives. That mm -hmm. sixth grade teacher changed the arc of my life. There's no question. Wow. Wow. And so many in our audience who are joining us live, shout out Maureen, shout out Noel in India saying this is an absolute dream. I think the reason they're so resonating with this is because entrepreneurship, it's its a vehicle for you to achieve your dreams in life and have the impact that you're looking to have. We work with Next Gen, so many folks who would define themselves as intrapreneurs. They're still in corporate, they're at these big companies, mm -hmm. but they want to take ownership and, and take control 
with that, I want to talk about your experience at Apple. So you get to Apple, and Apple is an environment that we could probably never replicate again. I can't even imagine what was going <laughs> on there. Did you have this clarity about you as an entrepreneur when you were at Apple and going on that journey to being the chief evangelist eventually? Talk to us about that time period and the energy so, of what yeah. you're seeing. So I got my job at Apple purely 100% because of nepotism. So my classmate from Stanford hired me. Without that, yeah, I, I mean, if you looked at my background on paper, I was in the jewelry business. I was a psych major. No high tech experience, no comp sci experience, nothing. M my primary qualification was that I was this guy's friend. So, you yeah, know, there's a lesson there. And the lesson there is that, well, there's several lessons. One lesson is uh, be good to the people you meet in college. That's lesson number one. <laughs> Uh, lesson number two is that you know, it doesn't matter how you get into a company or a situation. It matters what you do once you get in. So, And there's sort of two extremes in this. So one extreme is uh, you're the boss's son or you're the boss's daughter, and the boss, because of nepotism, gets you in. So you, know, you could question your qualifications the rest of your life you know would i really have gotten this job without being the boss's kid uh but i would say you know you got in that way but that doesn't mean that you succeeded because of that i mean the, with the assumption with the exception of the trumps but let's left let's just leave them aside so you know, I got in because of nepotism, but I did not succeed because of nepotism. I succeeded because of hard work and grit and luck and, you know, all the other stuff. So it doesn't matter how you get in. Um, I would also say that uh, it proves the story that, you know, on paper, many entrepreneurs, when they recruit, they have this very rational process. You know, we need somebody with the correct educational background with relevant work experience, okay? Okay. And I would ask you to consider one more variable, maybe the most important, which is, does the person get it and does he or she love what you do? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at me, I had a degree in psychology because that was the easiest major I could find at Stanford. And I was in the jewelry business, you know, literally counting diamonds. So you would not look at that resume on LinkedIn and said perfect person for Apple to evangelize a Macintosh operating system. But for me, uh, when my buddy showed me Macintosh the first time, it was a religious experience. It was like, I've had three, four religious experiences in my life. Seeing Macintosh for the first time, meeting the woman who became my wife the first time, uh, playing ice hockey the first time, and surfing the first time. So those are the four momentous, you know, religious experience. Oh, yeah. Now, when I saw Macintosh, I promise you, the angels started to play trumpets, and the skies parted, and the scales were removed from my eyes, and the, sh the sun broke through. I mean, every metaphor you can think of. When I saw Macintosh, I said, holy shit, man, this is... There is nothing cooler than this. Now, you have to put yourself back. This is in the mid-80s. And in the mid-80s, you know, personal computer meant you were typing on a keyboard. And if you wanted to make graphics, you would kind of use the X's and the O's to, you know, sort of make graphics like that using X's and O's. But this with a mouse and Mac Paint and Mac Write, you know, graphics, what you see is what you get. What you see is what you print. Uh paint brushes, fill patterns, all this great stuff that we take for granted today. That was just remarkable. Guy, this is incredible. Thank you so much for that authenticity. So many in our audience resonate with the grit that you showcased, right? To bring <laughs> that to life. I wanna dive right in on that note because something we love to promote and I know is core to you, you have to just get started, right? So you get in the door at Apple, you have this moment, this religious moment, if you will, and now you have a job that you have no experience in. There was no right. playbook for you. Nope. So what was your approach in those first six months to tackling this new opportunity with Steve Jobs as your <laughs> boss in a way? <laughs> Not in a way, for sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, okay? So it was the blind leading the blind there for a while because we, we were going where no man or no woman has gone before. 
Uh, now, there were personal computers before. There's the Apple One and the Apple Two and the Apple Three and Lisa and Commodore, and, you know, stuff like that. But this was an entirely new operating system. Um, the reason why we were called evangelists as opposed to third-party developer relations is because evangelism comes from a Greek word meaning bring the good news. So we were bringing the good news of Macintosh that would increase people's creativity and productivity, which is very different than introducing yet another personal computer. So it was about fervor and zeal and denting the universe and all that good stuff. And so um, you, know, you, you are a, a person. <sighs> is fortunate to get into something that fascinating and that powerful once in a career. I've had it twice. I am extremely lucky. Just getting it once is being lucky. Twice is extremely lucky. And, and Guy, very clearly, when you got that opportunity, you said, I don't. Even, I might not have the training, but I'm going to do whatever it takes. And shout out to so many in our audience who are tuning in, who I know are doing whatever it takes to build their dream. Natalia, thanks so much for tuning in. Noel saying he's got to get that signature. And this is all resonating so much. So let's go to that second opportunity at, if you're talking about it, Canva, an organization that we love so much for five oh, really? years. We were using Canva before, shout out Jay Reen and our team who's now been able to take up you know, a lot of the charge. What was it about the Canva product experience team that gave you parallels to those early experiences? What was so wow and eye-opening to you about well, that organization? Um, first of all, Canva found me. So I was very active on Twitter, and I believe that every tweet has to go with a graphic. And so the person who was helping me with social media, Peg Fitzpatrick, she was using Canva to make graphics for Twitter. And the people at Canva noticed that I was using Canva for Twitter. And so they reached out to me and they at mentioned me. And, you know, thank you, God, I happened to notice that at mention and responded. And next thing you know, they were visiting California. I met them and I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't looking for anything. Uh, the next thing you know, I'm chief evangelist. I've been there six years. And uh, I, I have this theory called Guy's Golden Touch. And. Now, many people may think, oh, guy's golden touch. Whatever guy touches turns to gold, like King Midas. It's not it. Guy's golden touch is whatever is gold guy touches. <laughs> so, this, is, this, is, this is the secret of evangelism. You know, a lot of people ask me, what's the secret to evangelism? Do you have to have a you know particular kind of uh, Myers-Briggs, INTJ, whatever, or do you have to have like an outgoing you know, shuck and jive, Jerry Maguire personality? What's it take? And I'm telling you, 90% of evangelism is finding, creating, or affiliating with a great product because mm -hmm. it is so easy to evangelize a great product and it's so hard to evangelize shit. So, guys, golden touches. I touch Macintosh and I touch Canva. Um, and yeah, you can give me credit for making those things successful or at least helping making those things successful, but I'll tell you that. Um, it was not hard <laughs> to evangelize either of those two things. That's amazing, Guy. And, and so much of, as you put it, uh, the, the luck aspect, it requires the work aspect to come with it, right? So those six yeah. years, no doubt, you have been only furthering that trend and that rising tide, if you will. Talk to us in, in the sense of a startup founder now, right? Our audience is out here. They're mm -hmm. young, early in their career, maybe building their first company. What are some of the marketing techniques that you push forward every day that we as startup founders with probably zero dollars can start evangelizing our own companies and brands moving yeah. forward. Well, first of all, social media is the best thing that ever happened to entrepreneurship, right? Because social media is fast and free and ubiquitous. So between social media and then using YouTube and Kickstarter, uh, it is a whole new world. I mean, back in the day when I was evangelizing Macintosh and yeah, late a few years after that, starting a software company, you know, what did you do? You went to Comdex and you bought a booth. Uh, if you were really going for it, you paid a hundred grand or ninety grand for a, an ad in the Thursday Wall Street Journal because that's the day that Walt Mossberg wrote his tech column. And so it was about advertising in MacWorld, PC World, the Wall Street Journal, and going to Comdex. Okay, so now you you can reach more people faster and cheaper than any of those resources. Uh, to take an extreme example, there's a guy named Marquise Brownlee, who I think is just the best tech YouTuber. So if today somebody said, guy, 
you have a new product. Either Marquise Brownlee will cover it or the Wall Street Journal will cover it. Guess who I would pick? It would not even be a close decision. Wow. So um, all of you, go look at Marquise Brownlee, uh, B-R-O-N-L-E-E, -E, on YouTube and watch what he does. Um, he, he is more powerful than the Wall Street Journal, Verge, TechCrunch, Wired, Fast Company, and CNET combined. Guy, I think it's so inspiring to hear you talking about how social media and all these different new platforms have really changed the game and uh, even the playing field for other folks who don't have that money and don't have that access to get in the game. And there are so many on our team, I think, are set, breathing a sigh of relief that are saying we can make it too because we don't have all the money in the world and we don't have all the access in the world. But we have a great heart. We know where we're going. We have great people who are supporting us. And we, with that, I want to transition to other changes that are happening in, in the marketplace. Can I, can I give you one more data point? Please, please. For those, for those of you who are worried about not having enough money, I think, it's cheaper, I think it's cheaper than ever to start a company. Of course, it's easy for me to say, but uh, but I would also make the case that uh, too much money is worse than too little. Because when you have too much money, you know, all of a sudden you think, oh, I just I just raised five million bucks. The investors gave me that not to put in a bank account, but to invest. So now I got to scale and uh, no more Ikea. Now we're going to buy Herman Miller. And, you know, we need to have we need to work on our branding and we need to position myself as a thought leader and all the bullshit. Um, and, you know, what what wh what are we standing for? And let's hire a. Uh, a PR firm and an ad firm and a social media firm. And, you know, you're not rolling your own anymore. You're defaulting to quote unquote experts who are hiring people with bachelor of arts and Oriental history to now do your social media. Um, I'm telling you, it's better to have too little than too much money. Wow. Uh, easy for, again, easy for me to say, but I'm not saying, I'm not saying, you know, you should wake up in the morning saying, thank God I don't have any money. <laughs> it's not that extreme. But, uh, you know, when somebody gives you five million bucks, they want a hundred million back. That's the kind of pressure you're putting on yourself immediately. Next gen entrepreneurs, you're hearing this first. If you're saying, hey, I got a, I got what I need to keep going. Maybe that's almost the best situation you can be in. So keep uh, creating that authentic content and that authentic output that guy is talking about in our own experience. Shout out Paul McNeil, who's watching, I think this live with us right now, one of our early evangelists of Next Gen HQ. And Paul has introduced us to more community members than a whole paid Instagram campaign for a year. Because when you really get in touch with people who feel and resonate with that mission. So guy, you're talking about a lot of marketplace changes, social media, crowdfunding, expanding the game. You're touching so many startups. What else is different about maybe starting a company today. And what are you looking for? You're meeting entrepreneurs all the time. They're coming to you for help, for marketing, for funding. What are some of the things that you're seeing about founders today that are either really inspiring to you, really exciting based on the marketplace or something maybe you're not so happy with based on what you've seen in the old days? Well, I mean, it's, it's so hard to produce generalizations coming covering all entrepreneurs today who are millennials right I mean, that's a little broad uh i i i think that basically entrepreneurship the spirit is not that different uh, whether it was 1970 or 2020 and it's about seeing the world as half full not half empty it's seeing the world as someplace with potential as opposed to you know just negativity it's believing that there must be a better way. Um, it's it's a fundamental faith in the quality of products and services that you know quality wins, not just bullshit marketing. Um, it, it's and and I don't think that's changed at all. Uh, now the mechanism may have changed. You may raise money using Kickstarter instead of venture capital. You know you may you may release your product using Instagram and Facebook as opposed to the Wall Street Journal. But the spirit of entrepreneurship, I think, is the same. I love that guy. And, and to that extent, while the channel and the mediums do evolve and they will continue to do so, we're going to come back to that in a second, the core principle still remains. And something that you uh, were quoted earlier a few years ago saying, you have to polarize people when it comes to marketing. Could you maybe share with our audience what you mean yeah. about being well, that polarizing brand or figure? Well, I uh, I don't want that misinterpreted. I'm not saying that you should wake up in the morning saying, how do I piss people off? <laughs> right? 
So I, I would say that if you make something great, it's going to generate strong emotions. Some people will love it. Some people will hate it. And that's okay. The worst case is nobody cares. So the goal is not to piss people off. The goal is to create something great. And one of the consequences of creating something great is that it's going to piss people off. So you know, when Elon Musk makes a Tesla, some people love it. Some people hate it, right? Um, the worst case for Tesla is nobody cares. And that clearly did not happen. And so whether it's Macintosh or Tesla or iOS or any great product, it polarizes people. That's okay. It's okay to polarize people if you're doing it because your product is maybe speaking to that piece yeah. of the market or speaking to that consumer who's maybe being largely ignored. Tesla, such a great example of how incredible they have done when galvanizing that yes. support from those folks. So there is some I mean, you know, you, you take some. You take something even like Canva, right? So Canva has basically democratized design. No question, right? No question. Almost anybody can make a great design now. Well, you know, if you had just invested 10 years and 10,000 bucks learning Photoshop, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe that's not the best thing you heard. So, uh, and again, you know, I, we didn't make Canva to piss off Photoshop users. We made Canva to democratize graphics for everybody. And arguably, a Photoshop user can use Canva for many purposes and use Photoshop for some very special things. Because, you know, Photoshop is a very, very deep product. It is the Mariana's trench of, of graphic editing. But I, I would say if if Photoshop is the Mariana's trent trench, uh Canva is like Waikiki Beach. So <laughs> I love it. Next gen fam, you don't have to be everything to everyone. I think that's a key lesson that guy you've always talked about is how define your value and have a product that really speaks to a consumer. It maybe shouldn't speak so broadly to every single person and every single use case. And there are many watching well, us live, or I know we're gonna watch this after as well, who represent organizations that help high school and, and college entrepreneurs. And a lot of them I, that we work with. Go ahead, guys. I, I, I think that trying to you know, appeal to, quote, unquote, everyone is a guarantee of mediocrity. Mm -hmm. It is inconceivable that if you try to appeal to, quote, unquote, everyone, you could create a great product. It's just not going to happen. It's that's you will be tugged in uh, to, to take a case like Macintosh. Right. So let's say you, you decided that you were going to make Macintosh appeal to everybody. So you'd say, okay, so we need backward compatibility with Apple II software. We need backward compatibility with MS-DOS. Uh, we need to run 123 on Macintosh, and we need to run Sticky Bears on Macintosh. And it has to appeal to uh, a Fortune 500 CIO, and it has to appeal to you know, one educator or one hobbyist sitting in his or her kitchen making – spreadsheets or tiny documents or whatever uh it, it, it it's hard enough to do one thing right much less trying to do everything right so it's just no can do just do one thing right and just hope that you're not the only nutcase that wants that next gen fam guy from straight from franzi a product manager she's saying like you're preaching guy is honestly the man and thank you for sharing that because it, <laughs> totally. it's it's resonating and inspiring to entrepreneurs who are saying you shouldn't Try to go be everything to everyone. That is going to hurt you, hurt your case, limit well, your product. I, I could give you another uh, theory about how you should design your product. Do it. And this theory is you make the product that you want to use. You know, not some theoretical millennial who who is, I don't know, 25 years old and whatever. Uh, you make the product that you want to use. That's what Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak did. I would say that's what Larry and Sergey did at Google. That's what Mark Zuckerberg did. So we're seeing a trend here. Great companies start because the founders made what they wanted to use, as opposed to being market-driven. And they looked at a market and they said, this is great potential, so we're going to make, you know, I don't know, shrimp farming software. <laughs> um you should make what you want to use. Now, it may be that you're the only two psychopaths in the world that wants it, but well, at least there's two. Uh, 
that's that's your best shot. I think that's the richest vein. I'm not saying it's 100% strikes, right? but it's the richest vein you can pursue. Guy, that is exactly resonating with our core audience. Natasha, you put in the comments, when we were getting started as entrepreneurs, we didn't know which way to look, right? And so we built this very logo next gen for ourselves. And of course, there's a time and a place and a need to go and ask our customers for feedback. How can we best serve you? How can we grow? But ultimately, if we relied on strictly the customers, I think innovation is impossible, right? That is what yeah. I, could be a dangerous well, bubble there. I mean, can, can you imagine if uh, Apple in the mid 80s went to their customers said, what would you want us to build? Well, somebody sneaking up on me. Oh. <laughs> My wife needs the checkbook. Get her on. I love it. Bring her on the show. She's Come one on. of four miracles, one of four heavenly moments. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, uh, no, where were we? Um, Apple and Steve Jobs, they're not yeah. the customers yeah, 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 yeah. on an iPhone, right? So, yeah. So, well, they, they certainly would have said, they would not have said, I want a new computer that cannot run any of the software that I have now that is vertically oriented with a one button mouse and has a WYSIWYG display because none of that was in the vernacular of anybody. Nobody could describe that because you never saw it before, right? And so now it's, you know, there's a famous saying about uh, Henry Ford saying, if you ask the Ford customer, if you asked someone who had a buggy what they wanted, they wouldn't say a car. They would say, you know, a bigger buggy or more horses or a better whip. But nobody would say a car. And if you ask an owner of a General Motors car what you want, they would say, you know, I don't know, more horsepower, less horsepower, greater mileage, less mileage. But no one would say, no, I want a, a car with a big battery. And then I want you to build an infrastructure of chargers all over the world so that I could take my battery car and go everywhere. Who, who What GM customer would have said that? We're getting questions on the same product note from LinkedIn, and I, I want to ask. So there are a lot of entrepreneurs who have these big ideas. Dylan and I, don't even get me started. We can talk to you in the next five hours about our big plans for Next Gen HQ. But Tim and Kyle are joining us. They're thinking about, well, I have these big plans, but how do I choose my feature set or my product set and my product roadmap? Urzan joining us as well to say, what are the key features that I can focus on that hit the most? When you're talking to product teams, entrepreneurs, how do you bring them down? You have that big vision, but how do you focus people on when they're building products? What's to put sequentially? Well, okay, so first, a data point. My observation, and I'm not saying I'm you know clairvoyant or you know, understand everything, but my observation is that these companies, the FANG companies, the, the 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 companies that have come to dominate the world, at the start of those companies, I don't believe that the founders had this megalomaniac, long-term, worldwide market domination plan. I think that Waz and Steve said, why do we have to go to Stanford or NASA to use a computer? Why can't we build a personal computer that's just for us? Okay. So I don't think when they started the company in 1976, I don't think they said, okay, so we're going to start with a personal computer. And then we're going to make it a graphical user interface. And then we're going to have this thing called a tablet. And then this tablet will lead to a phone. And then we're going to have these standalone retail stores. And in the standalone retail stores, which only sell our stuff, we're going to have a genius bar where people give tech support. And then we're going to have a market where people can buy apps to put on their phone and pads. <sighs> Basically, they said, why do we have to go to Stanford and NASA to use a computer? Why don't we have personal computers? And so, you know, so you start with a personal computer, it leads to another one and another one. And then you figure out, oh, maybe people want a handheld device. And then maybe people want to shop in a store that has just our stuff. And maybe people want to buy apps for their devices. And then one day you wake up and you say, holy shit, I am freaking trillionaire and I dominate the world. But so, you know, when people have big plans, I'm not against big plans, but I don't think that two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy in a gal garage should be sitting there planning worldwide domination. I think you should just try to like, you know, to use a Jeffrey Moore metaphor, 
the probability of you bowling a strike is very low. So what you need to do is just knock one pin over. And then you get another ball and you knock another pin over and another pin. And sometimes you have gutter balls, okay? But after a while, you look around and you say, holy shit, it took 20 balls, but all the pins are down. It wasn't a strike. It was 20 balls. So the people who have these great things, I think you should do one thing really well. Make it a business and then either extend it or get a complimentary business or something. But the plan of we're going to do everything, we're going to have retail, wholesale. We're going to have phone, pad, computer. We're going to have app store. We're going to have API licensing. We're going to patent our technology. Yeah, you, you two guys with your, you know, two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage with a quarter million bucks, you're going to do all that? Like, I don't think so. I love that guy. And, and for those of us who are fans of the, the Amazon story, right, Jeff Bezos, even if you believe he was chasing the everything store from the beginning, think about AWS, right? That's born out of his team's need. They developed it based on where they saw an opportunity. He wasn't thinking about that in the 90s when getting started. There's no way he was thinking about that. No chance. And, you know what? I guarantee you, when he started that company, he didn't, think, oh, you know, someday... We're going to have this thing called Amazon Prime and we're going to charge people 80 bucks and they're going to get free shipping and they're going to be so loyal because of that. There is no freaking way. My, I know for a fact, I just interviewed a, someone who was his chief of staff for uh, a good part of the biggest growth part of Amazon. So he, he's written a book called Working Backwards, which is the Amazon theory that you start with the customer and you work backwards. This is very different from, well, we can make a personal computer, so let's sell it to those people. You know, that's the opposite. That's like you can either make what you can sell or you can sell what you can make. And they're saying make what you can sell. So that would also be a good theory for. Um, and a the takeaway for, for me, Guy, right now, there is not one path to success, right? There are so many strategies we can learn, we can apply. And something that you're quoted saying a sign of intelligence is changing your mind, right? It's okay yeah. to go down a path and backtrack or realize you maybe can pursue yeah. another opportunity. This is, this is a very complex question because you know, there's sort of two theories, right? So one theory is you pivot. And the other theory is no matter what anybody else says, you believe and you gut it out, right? And those two theories are in complete and utter opposition. So which one do you believe? It kind of comes down to, well, what was the last keynote speech you went to? Or what was the last book you read, to, you read, right? Because if the last one was, oh, we started Google to be a consulting firm and we turned it into a search engine, then you think, oh, we should pivot. And then, you, you know, if you read the FedEx story and FedEx was almost out of money and, you know, they were just gutting it out and then suddenly situation turned around and, you know, they became successful because FedEx did not pivot. Well, therein lies the question about, you know, business speakers and, and business books, which is it's not a science. So there is no controlled experiment. There's no put two identical entrepreneurs with equal capabilities in an equal market with equal technology, have one pivot and have one stick it out, see which is better. There's no scientific tests like that. So that's why you should never be believe people like me. Because <laughs> guy. <laughs> guy, that's why. Like what you're doing and what we're doing is we're just trying to surround ourselves with really inspiring stories and see if we can learn and, and borrow from everybody and see what really resonates with you. And I, I know on that, looking at our time, I can't even believe we're almost out of time over here. I would be remiss if I didn't tell our audience about the opportunity where they can hear stories just like this, stories like Wozniak and others on this incredible podcast I hear about remarkable people. Tell us a little bit about that podcast, how it started and what you're excited about for it. So remarkable people is the love of my life. And I spend, if you look at my life and you were to plot amount of effort versus financial return, remarkable people is in the corner where there's infinite effort and hardly any return. <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> uh, and see, I, I'm dead serious. As I look back on my career, I think, Remarkable People Podcast is the best work I've ever done and the least appreciated. Wow. And so I've had of about 65 episodes right now, 
And it's people like, for, for an entrepreneur, the episodes you must listen to is Steve Wozniak explaining the inside story of starting Apple. There's Bob Cialdini, the author of Influence, Required Reading, you know, how to influence and persuade people. There's David Ocker, godfather of branding. How do you establish a brand? Uh, there is Ariana Huffington, how do you thrive? There is uh, Stephen Wolfram, the creator of Mathematica, uh, the language, MacArthur Award winner, the youngest MacArthur Award winner. Upcoming is going to be Angela Duckworth. She is the author of the book Grit. So she explains how to be gritty. So I, I'm telling you, humble brag, <laughs> my guest list is as good as any podcast in the world. And I tell people that remarkable people, and the website is remarkablepeople.com, duh, remarkable people, think of it as NPR without the pledge drive. That's what it is. Well, Guy, I might challenge you on that guest front because we have Guy Kawasaki on Momentum <laughs> Audio. So we'll see. We'll leave it up to the audience. But guy, before we let you go. Wait, wait, so uh, you have you have half a million. Uh, we got folks in our community who are tuning in from all across the world. I got my man, Noel, India. tuning in on India. Angela Duckworth, we haven't asked out. We haven't turned in. Barry Shore coming at us live. Are you, I don't know if you're in LA California. or San Fran right here. We got folks who want to know. So go to Remarkable Podcast. Guy, we're almost out of time. We got to ask you before we wrap up. What do you mean you're out of time? Well, what's what's gonna happen? I got I got my I got in this private chat over here. We got <laughs> we got instructions, audience. Guy, we we have the chance to pick Azerbaijan. The brain of, Azerbaijan, amazing. We have the rare chance to pick somebody's brain who has been around the block with some of the world's most impactful companies. So I want to ask you for our guests out there listening around the world, what industry, what topic, what piece of entrepreneurship is exciting you the most thinking 2021 looking ahead what are you pumped up for with the next generation well listen anybody who tells you they can predict the future is full of shit okay yeah. no nobody can do that i mean i remember a time when i thought that myspace was going to be the operating system of the internet right so myspace would dominate the world and Apple would be a little corner in the shopping center, and Amazon would be a little corner, and you know Microsoft would be a little corner, but the big picture was MySpace. Well, I guess I was wrong. So what I, the wisdom I would pass to you is, you know, don't listen to people like me predicting the future. You shouldn't listen to me and and so-called experts and influencers predict what the future is. You should go out and freaking build the future. Don't give a shit what I say it is. Just go build it. And then my job is to recognize that, holy shit, these two guys in the garage, two gals in the garage, they did build it. Guys, golden touch, baby. You build the future. I will touch you. <laughs> With that, <laughs> quote Mexico, of the day. Virginia, Guy, if you got the gold, he's coming to touch you. Guy Kawasaki, incredible startup leader, expert, evangelist at Canva, podcaster of Remarkable People. Guy, thanks so much for joining us on Momentum Audio. It's truly, truly my pleasure. And I expect half a million new subscribers. You heard it, Let's yo. Go. You heard Everybody it. Half a million. Guy's putting you on okay. there. Guy Kawasaki, Momentum <laughs> Audio. Thanks so much, Guy. Bye. We have folks who are tuned oh, in. Seth hopping in. Mexico, LA, Azerbaijan, Virginia, New York. And Guy Thank just you. called you out, y'all. Guy you. just said he wants half a million new folks subscribing on to Remarkable link. People. So we got it. We better. I got to go call some friends over here. We got to get some folks going. But he's got, some, he's got some good guests. But I got I to gotta say, Guy coming on Momentum Audio. Now we are talking. Tim, thank you so much. Natasha, thank you so much for making that happen. We Kyle, are absolutely Kyle's grateful. Incredible. Unbelievable exposure that he's had. He's worked with Steve Jobs, now one of the hottest new billion dollar companies. That guy knows it all. Go check out his books. He's a plethora of resources and knowledge. And we're blessed to have had the opportunity yeah. to pick his brain. Today. Next Gen Fam, we want to know your feedback on how this is going. We're trying to bring you the best guests literally in the world that we can find this Thursday. Well, I don't know if you're tuning in live or not live. This Thursday, we have a billionaire businessman, philanthropist, founder of Kind. We are road to a million. Chris, my man, you know what's going on. So Next Gen Fam, we love you. Wishing you an incredible rest of your Tuesday and week. Thanks so much for joining us on this adventure. DJ, peace out.